Welcome everyone to a very special uh, event between the New Zionist Congress and Ben Freeman. Ben Freeman is a valued member of the advisory board of the New Zionist Congress. Um, we are so lucky to have his insight and his voice supporting us and on our team. Today, this evening, he's going to give a lecture and then hopefully we will be able to have a conversation on the subject of Holocaust revisionism. We chose this date to have this discussion, of course, because it is now just past Yom HaShoah, at least if you're on the west, uh, East Coast, sun just went down. So it has hopefully been a day of reflection um, for you and a meaningful day for you and your family and all those you know who are affected um, by the Holocaust. And the subject, the issue of Holocaust revisionism remains a very important topic um, in the Jewish community and outside of the Jewish community because we can't seem to get a break from it, both inside and outside uh, of our community. So Ben is here to talk about all of that. We are very grateful to have him and he is here to answer your questions. So if you have any questions um, that you would like him to answer afterwards, please send them. I will drop uh, in the group chat right now. Please send your questions to newzionists.org. Nope, I'm sorry, newzionists at gmail.com. That's it, newzionists at gmail.com. We will send those to Ben uh, to answer. Without further ado, Ben Freeman needs no introduction, but I'm going to give one anyway. So Ben Freeman was born, in, oh, excuse me, born in Scotland. Ben is a gay Jewish internationally renowned author, educator, and diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist focusing on Jewish identity, combating Jew hatred, and raising awareness of the Holocaust. He came to prominence during the Corbin labor Jew hate crisis and quickly became one of his generation's leading voice against anti-Jewish racism. Ben is the founder of the modern Jewish pride movement and the author of the Jewish pride manifesto, Jewish pride rebuilding a people released in February, 2021 to great international acclaim. If uh, Ben, maybe I'm just gonna actually drop the uh, URL, the link to your website so that people can peruse and also buy the book if they if their heart desires. Thank Sarah you. Kay says, it's an amazing book. We should take Sarah's word for it. Um, all right, so Ben, I'm gonna allow you to introduce yourself if there's anything that I missed and I'm gonna hide myself and you can of course uh, take it away. I'm just gonna see, how do I hide myself? So that I am, hmm. I'm just gonna do that, okay, perfect. And I'm gonna stop my video too, so it doesn't show up. Okay, take it away, Ben. So thank you so much, Blake, and thank you so much to the Zionist Congress for having me. Um, I'm really proud to be involved in this amazing organization. Um, and yes, yeah, so today I will be speaking about Holocaust revision because I, although as Blake mentioned, I kind of came to prominence because of the Corbyn labor crisis, I've been a Holocaust educator for, around 15 years by this point. I'm 35 years old, so I started pretty young. Um, and it's something that's very close to my heart. And as Blake said, we're not catching a break. And really the memory of the Holocaust is under attack. And it speaks to kind of a larger phenomenon with regards to how Jews are perceived. So I've got a, a presentation, a lecture, and then as Blake said, we'll open up for some questions. So let me just share my screen. So I'm gonna have to ask, can you guys see my screen? I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take your silence as a yes. So that is the teacher, the dreaded question that every teacher had to ask during online school. So this is a lecture, as I said, about Holocaust revision. Before we start talking about Holocaust revision, we really need to define the Holocaust. And I want to be very clear how I define the Holocaust. And I want to explain to you why I define it in the way that I do. So I'll start off by saying there are definitely those who disagree with me, and that's absolutely fine. But I define the Holocaust as a solely Jewish experience. So it was the mass extermination of six million Jewish people and the civilizations they represented. And it took place simultaneously and sometimes in the same places as other genocides slash crimes against humanity. So I'm not for one second, you know, denying or diminishing the experience of other communities, the LGBTQ community, of course, the Roma community. But from my perspective, they all had their own kind of distinct experience and they should be spoken about as such. 
So this is a quote from Adolf Hitler from 1919, and it kind of helps explain why I see the Holocaust as a solely Jewish experience. And he said, the ultimate goal must definitely be the removal of the Jews altogether. And one thing we have to understand about Nazism is how central Jew hate was to it. So Jew hate was one of the defining pillars of Nazism. Some even go far as saying that the real war the Nazis were fighting was against the Jews as opposed to the um, allies. And it's really, really important to consider that this was really incredibly central to what the Nazis were doing, which is why it spread over a continent. And, you know, I'm teaching cl a class on the Holocaust right now. And I was saying to my students, you know, one of the reasons the Holocaust is unique is that it was across, a, well, really more than a continent, actually, it was across the European continent. It took place in the Middle East and in North Africa. And that's obviously very different to the Rwandan genocide, which took place in Rwanda, or the Cambodian, which took place in Cambodia. And that's, again, not to diminish. But in terms of historical accuracy, we have to understand how these different uh, occurrences are distinct. And the Holocaust was really, as I said, the war the Nazis were fighting. And... Of course, other communities were impacted and of course, other communities were targeted in very real and serious ways. But this was not the, the, the prejudice which governed those experiences was not as central to the Nazis as Jew hate was. And again, it's not diminishing it. It's just we have to base our understanding of these events in reality with understanding nuance. So as I said, Jew hate was totally central to Nazism, and it really was dominated by anti-Jewish racism, and everything the Nazis believed to be problematic with the world could be blamed on Jews. You had Jewish Marxism, Jewish parliamentary democracy, Jewish liberalism, and again, we're not seeing the same rhetoric with regards to other communities. Of course, they were persecuted alongside the Jews, but they were persecuted often to be very, to be very upfront, secondary. Now, the Roma community, which I will speak in about in a moment, they had quite a distinct experience, um, but I will get to that. So again, it's not to suggest me defining the Holocaust as a solely Jewish experience. is isn't to suggest that it's more important, that the Jewish experience is more important than any other. It's just acknowledging the distinct nature of the crimes committed against the Jews. And I think that is really important, particularly with the memory of the Holocaust so under attack. So the Roma. So there are many people who would agree with me to an extent and they say, yes, most of the experiences are not part of the Holocaust, but the Roma are. So the Roma um, have many similarities in their experience and they were often persecuted and they were often murdered in the same places or imprisoned in some of the same ghettos. But their experience is distinct. And one of the reasons it's distinct is because it's ha it has its own context. You know, anti-Roma racism still exists today. It existed before the Nazis came to power. And we have to understand it in its own context. And to be honest, lumping things together under one banner is not only problematic, as we will see, but I also think it's quite lazy. And the Roma have their own experiences called the Paranios. And I think that we should understand this, we should study it. It's a really deeply important part of history. But as I said, I believe they should be separately defined. So Holocaust denial, before we get into Holocaust revision, let's speak about kind of its precursor, which is Holocaust denial. So this is kind of an obvious thing to say, but Holocaust denial began during the campaign to exterminate the Jews. So it began during the Holocaust itself. And Holocaust denial was really perpetrated by the Nazis. So they were um, keeping their crimes, excuse me, a secret. They were covering them up. So they were very much engaged in the Holocaust denial. And initially Holocaust denial aimed to do three things. One, it denied that six million Jews were murdered. Number two, it denied the existence of the gas chambers. And often you will hear people say, six million Jews were not murdered in the gas chambers. But actually no one claims that. Because as we know, there were many methods in which the Jews were murdered or by which the Jews were murdered. And probably about half of the Jews murdered during the Holocaust were murdered in the gas chambers. But that amounts to about three million. And they denied there was a plan to murder Jews. So they say the final solution was not central to Nazism. There was not this plan. It just kind of happened as a byproduct. And following the war, Holocaust denial grew in popularity. And there was a brief moment, it became mainstream, or at least slightly more mainstream. And you had Holocaust deniers or the Holocaust being debated on American TV shows. And it often went hand in hand with anti-Zionism. But 
Holocaust and Ireland this way, apart from the fringes, apart from the kind of the most extreme, which still does exist today, I'm not saying it doesn't exist today, but for the most part, it was delegitimized by the Lipstadt Irving trial in the early 2000s, because David Irving was found to be a Holocaust denier, he was found to be a racist against Jewish people. So that really um, changed how Holocaust style was seen. But that didn't mean these ideas went away. As we know with Jew hatred or everything connected to Jew hatred, it is constantly evolving. So while Holocaust denial, overt Holocaust denial, large gross Holocaust denial kind of maybe went out of fashion, other forms grew to replace it. So for the most part, we see overt Holocaust denial transformed into Holocaust revision. And again, I'm not saying that Holocaust denial doesn't exist today. We know it does. We know that Iran had that competition to deny the Holocaust. We know that the Holocaust denial is rife in many parts of the world, but particularly in the West, we're now seeing Holocaust revision and particularly in academia, which was a center of Holocaust denial previously. So let's think about some examples of modern revisionism. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take us through some examples of modern revision, trivialization, inversion, and then we'll talk a little bit about why, and then we're going to talk about how to counter it. So one of kind of the major examples of Holocaust revision today is from Poland. And this is the, they have the Act on the Institute of National Remembrance, and there was an amendment made to that act in 2018. And it was a Polish law, this is a Polish law, that penalizes public speech, which attributes responsibility for the Holocaust to to Poland or the Polish nation. So you may have seen this on Twitter if you're online. I think it might be this discourse might be slightly uh, less significant on Instagram, but it's certainly there on Twitter. If you say, for example, Auschwitz was in Poland, Belzec was in Poland, six million Jews or three million Jews were murdered in Poland, someone will come at you and often it's Polish state um, accounts. Sometimes Auschwitz, the Auschwitz account itself, they'll say no, it was on Poland, uh, Nazi occupied Poland, which is absolutely true. Poland was not in control of its own territory from 1939 to 1945. That's absolutely the case. But it's a lot more nuanced than these kind of accounts are making it seem. And it's a lot more nuanced than this law is making it seem. And really what we have to understand this as, this is state-sponsored Holocaust revision, state-sponsored Holocaust denial, really. So this was uh, a statement by a judge regarding this law. We can assume that ascribing to Poles the crimes of the Holocaust committed by the Third Reich can be constructed as, or construed, excuse me, as harmful and detrimental to the sense of identity and of national pride, attributing to the Polish nation the responsibility for the Holocaust, for the killing of Jews during World War II, and for the confiscation of their property, touches upon the sphere of national heritage, and consequently, as completely untrue and harmful, can significantly impact one's feelings of one's of own national dignity, destroying the justified, based on facts, belief that Poland was the victim of war operations initiated and conducted by the Germans. So really what we're seeing here is Poland not wanting to face the facts that they occupy, and I have a slide that says this in a minute, they occupied dual roles. They were absolutely victims of Nazism, but they were also perpetrators and they were also um, contributing to the murder of the Jews. It's fact. And Poland um, has a very high, high number of righteous among the nations. So they're non-Jewish people who saved the lives of Jews during the Holocaust. And that award is given out by Yad Vashem, the museum in Jerusalem. And it's, as I said, it's true, there were many um, Polish uh, righteous, but what we see in Poland is the number of righteous being kind of exaggerated to downplay the fact that Polish people were also involved in the murder of Jews. So Poles were both victims and perpetrators, but Poland wants to deny that. They want to only say that it, they were victims and they were not perpetrators. And this is significant because it's an attack on truth. It's an attack on our experience. And one of the things we have to understand, and again, I have a slide that says this later, the Holocaust is often viewed, it's often talked about as this very distinct event within Jewish history. And of course it is deeply important and there are aspects of it which are unique. But what we have to understand is that the story that led to the Holocaust did not begin in 1933. It began thousands of years ago and it's still being written today. So we have to ask what are the consequences going to be if a society that murdered Jews denies that? What impact is that going to have on modern Jew hatred? What impact is that going to have have on modern relationships between Poles and Jews, when Jewish people like me and like others say, no, you did murder Jews during the Holocaust. You did contribute. You did participate. So 
It is an attack on truth and it's an attack on the Jewish experience. And we're also seeing this as a wider trend in Eastern Europe and particularly in the Baltic states. I think, you know, I can't remember the, the country off the top of my head, but I believe there was another country who was considering this law. And we're also seeing the kind of raising up of Nazis or people who murdered Jews, people who aligned themselves with the Nazis, but who also fought the communists. And we're going to get to this kind of a little bit later, but we're seeing this across Eastern Europe. So because Poles may have been nationalists or, you, or Ukrainians or whoever may have been nationalists fighting against the Soviet Union, they are praised and seen as freedom fighters when in actual fact they murdered Jewish people. So there's a huge amount of revision and denial happening in Eastern Europe. Another modern example, excuse me, take a drink, took place in Texas. And, you know, in some ways, this is more frightening because we know that Eastern Europe has a complicated relationship with its Jews. You know, we know the events of the pogroms. We know what happened during the Holocaust in spite or despite what Poland is saying. But it's quite frightening that this isn't just in Eastern Europe. This is happening all over the world and in the United States. So Gina Petty, who is a top administrator in a Texas school district, she instructed teachers to use books offering opposing perspectives on the Holocaust. And this frames the Holocaust as a conflict, as opposed to a genocide. Perpetrators can then be transformed into heroes and victims into oppressors. And this is again, as part of a wider trend. We saw this in the UK. I remember being in the gym in London during the summer of 2019, and I was working out and I was watching the news and they had a, a scrolling headline across the bottom and it said, Labour anti-Semitism row. So I think Americans find it quite difficult to understand me when I say row. It means like row, which is the, my American accent, like a quarrel, a conflict. And what they were doing was framing this labor anti-Semitism crisis as a conflict between labor and the Jews, as opposed to a situation where labor, the second party in the British Parliament, was actively targeting the Jews, a tiny ethno-religious community. So this is really part of a similar idea. And this is part of this wider trend to teach all different aspects of history, you know, and, and I'm known in my school for being really focused on nuance and complexity. And I say to my students, you know, the vast majority of things, there's different perspectives. The Holocaust is not one of them. There are no different perspectives on the Holocaust. And in fact, the different perspectives on the Holocaust are Holocaust revision and Holocaust denial. But this is incredibly dangerous. And of course, this was not mandated by the US federal government, but this is not dissimilar, um, or it's rather, I would say, part of the same story. Not the exact same, of course, there's nuance, but part of the same story is what's happening in Poland. It's an attack on truth. The fact that we're able to deny things which are historically provable is very worrying. And the fact that this trend is happening so specifically with regards to Jewish experience is incredibly distressing. And we're gonna talk again about why this is happening at the end. So if you have any questions about why this is happening, I will get to that. But again, please feel free to ask questions at the end. So this Gina Petty says, and make sure that if you have a book on the Holocaust that you have one that has an oppo that has opposing that has the other perspective and then a teacher replied how do you oppose the holocaust and this is a kind of a transcript of the conversation but the holocaust has become something that people can debate once again remember after the holocaust from the 1960s you know particularly after the war but also from the 1960s we saw holocaust revision holocaust denial become more mainstream they had debates about it on national television on talk shows that's what this is it is denying the Jewish experience. It's questioning the Jewish experience. So I want to talk a little bit about President Zelensky. So obviously he is someone very much admired by the world. So I want to make sure we're having this conversation in a very specific, clear way. So President Zelensky, he has been accused of Holocaust revision. But there's a huge amount more to this story than just his comments. So I've labeled this slide here, the result of state-sponsored revision. And the state-sponsored revision I'm referring to is by the Soviet Union. So he accused, Zelensky accused Russian President Vladimir Putin of trying to carry out a final solution. And he made this speech in the Israeli parliament and we'll look at a couple of his comments later and then some of the responses that came, that came afterwards. And this bothered a lot of people. It bothered me. I said something on Twitter about it and people were not very happy because Zelensky is someone who people aren't really willing to criticize right now. And I understand that. 
But again, we have to talk about truth. We have to talk about nuance. And we have to understand that Zelensky's comments are really a direct result of state-sponsored suppression of the Holocaust as a Jewish experience by the Soviet Union. So if any of you have been to Poland, if any of you have been to Eastern Europe, and you go to visit the site of the Holocaust, so those could be Babi Yar, which was, I don't think it was destroyed, I don't think it was um, um, injured, I guess, I can't think of the other word, but it was, uh, there was a television tower right next to Babi Yar that was blown up. So Babi Yar, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Chelmno, any of the major sites of the Holocaust, we see something very fascinating and we see very Soviet memorials and what do I mean by that so they were Soviet in aesthetic huge imposing um, enormous enormous structures that dominate the space and often they don't actually mention Jews so the Soviet Union did not speak about the Holocaust as a Jewish experience they spoke about the Second World War and they spoke about the crimes of the Nazis and of course, as we mentioned, Poles, Russians, other people in that region were targeted for the Nazis. Although if they were not Jewish, they were not part of the Holocaust. However, the Soviet Union kind of spoke about it under one umbrella and they denied the specificity of the Holocaust as a Jewish experience. And this is why Zelensky made the comments he made. And I understand that people are getting very kind of alarmed by it. And I said I was as well. And the reason we get alarmed is because there is a much wider context that we're seeing here. So Zelensky's comments were not made in a vacuum, even though his comments were kind of rooted in another context. So President Zelensky said, when Russians are telling about neo-Nazis and they turn to me, I just reply that I've lost my entire family in the war because all of them were exterminated during World War II. This is a very interesting way to talk about this. He doesn't say my family were targeted because they were Jewish. He doesn't say my family were murdered in the Holocaust. He doesn't say my family were murdered in genocide. He said, I've lost my entire family in the war because all of them were exterminated during World War II. And that is what the Soviet Union taught. That was, it was a totalitarian state, there was not room for other perspectives, so Jews in the Soviet Union did not necessarily understand the Holocaust in the way we do in the West. They saw it, okay, so the Nazis did all of these awful things to many, many groups of people. Whereas in the West, we obviously, most of us anyway, see it as a Jewish experience. The Soviet Union specifically didn't teach it in that way. And this is the root of Zelensky's comments. He essentially does not understand the events of the Holocaust. And I don't say that to diminish him or to insult him. I say that to really point the blame to the Soviet Union and to say this is what happens when we have state-sponsored denial. So if we cast our minds back, what is going to happen in Texas? What is going to happen in Poland? There will be generations of people who do not understand the events of the Holocaust. And we're already seeing that today. And we'll talk a little bit about those statistics at the end. He also said, Ukrainians made their choice. 80 years ago, we saved Jews. And this, listen, of course, there were some Ukrainian righteous among the nations, just as there were many Polish Ukrainians, uh, sorry, Polish righteous among the nations. But it is by and large not true that Ukrainians saved Jews. In fact, Ukrainians are almost disproportionately represented in the crimes against the Jews. So even in crimes that took place out with Ukraine, even in crimes that took place in the Baltic states, in Poland, we see Ukrainians being present and Ukrainians actively participating. But again, the fact that Zelensky believes this is not necessarily his fault. He has, been, he has inherited this lie that was taught by the Soviet Union. It was to glorify Eastern Europe, glorify communism, glorify the Soviet world and demonize the Nazis without any nuance. And despite the fact that actually Eastern Europeans were perpetrators as we discussed when we referenced the Polish law. So Danny Diane, the chair of the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial Center says, let me just take a drink. Let's make a clear differentiation between the Russian invasion, which is deplorable. And apparently there are lots of actions taken by the Russian army that are apparently beyond the pale. And historical comparisons, the wrong historical equivalences that President Zelensky made, especially his reference to the final solution. And this is where people get upset and people kind of find it difficult to talk about. Because when one says, this is not like the Holocaust, people often assume you're saying it's not bad. And it's simply not true. What we need to do is defend the memory of the Holocaust as a specific event and not allow it to be trivialized, not allow it to be universalized. And 
this kind of a fight we're engaged in is not to say that other experiences don't matter. It's not to say that other experiences aren't terrible. Clearly what is happening in Ukraine now, right now is terrible. Crimes against humanity are being perpetrated. There is no doubt in my mind that that is the case, but that does still not make it the Holocaust. The Holocaust is a specific event driven by Jew hatred, and it was the industrialized murder of six million Jewish people across three, even maybe four continents. So we have to really, really understand nuance. And we have to take a little bit of a step back and be kind of objective scholars and not allow our emotional responses to the events we're seeing on television cloud our ability to be distinct and be accurate. So something I'm sure we've all seen is the Holocaust has been remade as a universal symbol. And I wrote an article about this for a Canadian newspaper just before Holocaust Memorial Day. And I said, and I said this on Twitter yesterday and on, and on Instagram, the primary lessons of the Holocaust never again must primarily apply to the persecution of Jews. That is not to say there are not secondary meanings. There are not secondary lessons that can be learned. But the primary lessons of the Holocaust must be regarding Jew hatred. However, we see the Holocaust has been remade as a universal symbol. So this really has kind of resulted in the de-Jewification of the Holocaust. So it's no longer a, a solely Jewish event. The Jews have been removed. And it's, as I said, it's been remade as a symbol of universal suffering. And it means it's no longer considered a Jewish experience. And this is why specificity is so important. We have to be accurate when describing the events. So again, to cast your mind back when I said that I define the Holocaust as a Jewish experience, it's not to diminish other experiences, it's to be accurate, because look at what we see. And unfortunately, Jewish people ourselves, we have contributed to the idea that the Holocaust is a universal symbol. But again, this was not nefarious. This was, in a way, it's quite tragic. So as we see here, Simon Wiesenthal, the famed Nazi hunter, he inadvertently contributed to the de of the Holocaust, to the universalization of the Holocaust, by making up the number of five million non-Jews murdered. So I'm not sure if any of you have heard this. Many people said, especially a few years ago, they talked about 11 million. 11 million people were murdered by the Nazis in the Holocaust, in these crimes. I myself, when I used to talk about the Holocaust, that was a figure I cited. But what we've seen, that number is made up because we don't necessarily know the number of non-Jews murdered in the way we know the number of Jews, because again, there were differences in the experiences. The Nazis documented everything they were doing to the Jews. We have videos, we have photographs, we have beggars, because the Nazis themselves recorded it. This was not necessarily the case with the other communities that they targeted. So while we know around 15,000 gay and bisexual men were murdered, we're not entirely sure of the number. So this number, 5 million, was really made up, and it was made up to attract attention from the non-Jewish world to the Holocaust and to increase their sympathy. And the reason 5 million was chosen was because it had to be less than the 6 million, of course, so it wouldn't kind of, let's say, outshine the Jewish experience, which I know is kind of a gross way to say that, but I'm sorry I couldn't think of another phrase, but this has contributed to the de jewification of the Holocaust. And even on Twitter, I saw this when I woke up this morning, people are saying, oh, the Jews can't talk about the Holocaust as a just as just a Jewish experience, because it is a universal experience that happened to other people. So it has been stripped from us, it is no longer belongs to us, it belongs to the world. And that's very problematic when we consider that the world is steeped in Jew hatred. One of the first examples, or, or a very a very early, let's say, maybe not one of the first, but a very early example of Holocaust revision was from Edward R. Murrow. And he was an American uh, news broadcaster who went with the press corps to the camps. He toured Buchenwald and he made this statement and it's so fascinating. So let's read it. We entered, men and boys reached out to me. They were in rags. Death had already marked many of them. One rolled up, rolled up his sleeve, showed me his number. It was tattooed on his arm. Men kept coming up to me to speak. Perspe professors from Poland, doctors from Vienna, men from all over Europe, men from the countries that made America. So let's talk about Murrow's comment. So he has specified gender. We see here men and boys. So he has specified one kind of distinct marker of identity. 
he specified career, professors from Poland, doctors from Vienna, and he specified country of origin, Poland, Vienna, men from the countries that made America, men from all over Europe, but he doesn't mention Jews. This is staggering. The reason that these men were in Buchenwald is not because they were professors or doctors, is not because they were from Poland or Vienna, not because they were men or boys, but because they were Jews. So this is a very early example of the universalization of the Holocaust. And as a Holocaust scholar, this is something I'm particularly interested in. And I will do a, I'm looking down at a command F, that's the search function, right? Command F. And I will, when I'm reading articles about the Holocaust, I will do command F and I will search. Do they mention the word Jew? Do they mention the word Jewish? Do they mention the word anti-Semitism? And I, you'll be, kind of shocked, I think, at how many do not. I remember there was a comment made by um, President um, Trudeau, I forgot his name for a second, Pres uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, not President, they're the Commonwealth, the Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau. There was a Holocaust survivor that I think something happened, they either died of COVID or something, and he talked about them coming to Canada and being a refugee, didn't mention the reason they were a refugee, didn't mention the fact that they were Jewish. And this is important. It's important that we are able to own our identity. And this is part of this wider concept that I, I named a couple of years ago in an article called Erase of Jew Hate, the erasure of Jewishness. Our identity is stripped from us and our experience. So this is a quote from a British person. And this is about the Board of Deputies. So the Board of Deputies is kind of the official Jewish representation in the UK. And this person said, what, why are they only thinking about the Jews that were murdered? And this was, a, this was yesterday, by the way. So this is about Yom HaShoah. Why are they only thinking about the Jews that were murdered? What about Romani, disabled, etc.? Anyone who didn't conform to the Aryan ideal was murdered, not just Jews. And people who say this, they, they feel themselves as righteous. They see that they are standing up for communities who are being marginalized, even in this story, that they're standing up to the Jews for dominating this experience. This is the result of the universalization of the Holocaust. This is the result of Holocaust revision. This is not taking place. This conversation did not take place on Holocaust Memorial Day, which is a day that was created to mark the Holocaust and other genocides, crimes by the Nazis and other genocides. So that is a complicated day in terms of what we talk about. This is Yom HaShoah. This is the Jewish day to remember our dead, those that were stolen from us. And because of the universalization of the Holocaust, we are accused of being in some way exclusionary, that we're choosing to exclude those other groups. And this goes back to this idea of Jewish conspiracy, even blood libel, where we think our lives are more important, we don't care about other communities. It's all wrapped up in Jew hatred. So this is a very interesting phrase, um, poster, or uh, rather sign, that you may not recognize, although some of you, if you've been in my webinars before, you may have seen this. So as you know, I live in Hong Kong for the moment. And about three years ago, Hong Kong was rocked by the Hong Kong protests, civil unrest that was really quite frightening. And we saw this specific phrase emerge during this protest period, and it was Chai Nazi. Now, this is a portmanteau of Chinese and Nazi. And the protesters were saying, Dear world, in Chai Nazi. So they were saying to the world, please, the Chinese are like the Nazis. And if the Chinese are like the Nazis, even though we see universalization of the Holocaust, we see the protesters appropriating Jewish victimhood and borrowing, appropriating the idea that they are the Jews. If the Chinese are the Nazis, they are the Jews. Now, as someone who lives in Hong Kong, I can't say too much about China, but obviously China is engaged in its own crimes against humanity and it has been accused of genocide. We're aware of this. That still does not make it the Nazis. Why? Because not everything terrible has to be compared to the Nazis. We are actually allowed to talk about things in their own distinct way. But this was what this is what we saw an appropriation of Jewish victimhood, not unlike this. Not vaccine equals not vaccinated equals Yuda. Not vaccinated equals Jew. This was what we saw 
all over the world during the kind of height of the, the COVID pandemic when we were having conversations about vaccinations. They were appropriating this symbol, the yellow star. They were appropriating Jewish victimhood to label themselves as victims. This is part of another story where the world uses the Jews to define their identities. And I talk about that in my book, but it also specifically relevant to us when talking about universalization because the Holocaust for these people is just this terrible thing that happened that they can use they can appropriate because it belongs to everyone so they think. We also saw this rhetoric with the denazification of Ukraine or rather we saw this rhetoric with accusations or with the idea that Ukraine needed to be denazified and this was by Putin and this was not the first time he did this. This happened a lot in 2014 with the revolution, with Crimea. The Russians said the Ukrainians are the Nazis. And they do that because in Ukraine, as we know, there are some far right elements, although they're much smaller than the, than the Russians will kind of um, imply or state. And this, again, is using the Holocaust as this universal symbol. So the Ukrainians are like the Nazis, therefore Russia needs to go in as the liberators as they did before. So it's part of this wider story. And it's using the Holocaust. It's appropriating the Holocaust. And it's why it's so dangerous. The Holocaust is not a symbol. It is our reality. It is our families, it is our experience, it is our trauma as a collective Jewish family. And it is not something to be used to make a point. It is not something to be, to be used to cast yourself as a victim, to say that you don't want to get a vaccine or to justify an illegal war. But all of these are quite disparate, quite separate examples, but they're all part of the same story. The universalization of the Holocaust, which is part of Holocaust revision. So very briefly, I want to talk about Holocaust trivialization. So I'm not sure if any of you watched and just like that, the kind of reboot of Sex and the City, which was terribly disappointing as a committed SATC fan. It was quite terrible, to be honest. But there was a moment where the Holocaust was trivialized. And I'm not sure if anyone has seen it. I know Blake hasn't. We spoke about it the other day. But Anthony, one of the characters, came to a Shabbat dinner with a date. His date did not know he was going to Shabbat dinner. And, you know, Shabbat was referenced and the date goes, oh, is this a Jewish dinner? And they say yes. And then the date goes, oh, you know, the Holocaust never happened. And then Anthony, the character says, out. And the guy leaves. And it's played for a laugh. Again, the genocide of six million Jews is played for a laugh. The kind of destruction of Jewish civilization is played for a laugh. The destruction of 40% of the world's Jewish population, two thirds of the Jews in Europe is being played for a laugh. That is disgusting. And I'm not gonna make a comment. We often in these conversations, we say, would this happen to other communities? I'm not sure, if, I'm not sure to be honest. Sometimes yes, depending on the community, sometimes no. But there would be a backlash, I think, for most other communities. Maybe not all, but most. No one talked about this. No one really talked, apart from the Jews, of course, that the Holocaust was played for a laugh. There's another kind of trivialization, and I mentioned this previously when I talk about the Eastern Europeans kind of praising those who joined the Nazis or what worked with the Nazis to fight communists, because there is an equivalence between Nazism and communism, or between the crimes of the Nazis towards the Jews specifically and the Soviet Union's crimes. And listen, the Soviet Union's crimes are kind of immeasurable. We, of course, understand that they were the ones who really propagated anti-Zionism, they were persecuting Jews, for many, many decades. And of course, they were murdering other communities and other groups. They had their own kind of concentration camp system. They had gulags. So they were terrible. They were absolutely terrible. But were they carrying out genocide like the Nazis carried out genocide against the Jews? Not necessarily. Because again, the Holocaust, the persecution of six million Jews was the industrialized murder the attempt to wipe out a civilization, to wipe out an entire people. And again, this is not to say that communism is fine and Nazism is bad or communism is less bad than Nazism. It's to say we must be accurate. We must talk about things in their own context. And there are many conversations, as the Zionist Congress often has, about the Soviet Union. 
They are not to be diminished. Their crimes are not to be diminished or indeed trivialized, but we must be very careful about making false equivalents where equivalence does not lie. We must be able to talk about things within their own context. And here it says Between the Bloodlands by Timothy D. Snyder, which is this book here. And this is a very controversial book, which really does this. It kind of makes this false equivalence and says the Nazis were just as bad for Eastern Europe as the communists were, which of course is a much more complicated thing to talk about. So Holocaust inversion. So we're almost at the question part of the presentation, the lecture. So this was really propagated originally by the Soviet Union and the Arab states as part of anti-Zionism. So this is a poster from the Pravda Vostoka, a Soviet newspaper, which really paints the Israelis, the Jews, as the Nazis. We have images of them sharing bottles. So they were very keen on this as a way to delegitimize the state of Israel. Because even after the Holocaust, the, the world was really shocked by the crimes they'd committed. Because even if the world hates Jews, as I argue they do. There is a leap from hating a people, not trusting a people, to murdering a people en masse. The world was shocked, and this Holocaust was seen as a supreme act of evil. And by inverting it, by making the Jews the perpetrators, they kind of diminish any sympathy, any empathy, any understanding of the Jewish experience. They paint the Jews as the oppressors. And this is a modern poster. This is from 2009. It says, new Nazis, fascist murderers. Pastor Neymoller said they came for the Jews and we did nothing. If they come again, we'll point the murderers out. Firstly, this whole, at first they came for the whoever, that's actually quite a problematic poem if we really get into it, but we don't have time to do that today. But this is what they're saying. Israel is the new Nazis. This is erroneous and it is only said to hurt Jewish people. And it is only said to diminish the crimes of the Jew, of the Nazis, excuse me. I worked at the Israeli, uh, Israeli embassy in London in 2006, I was an intern, and it was just after the Lebanon war, that summer's Lebanon war, and I used to have to answer the phones and people would call up and say, you're the new Nazis. And I was kind of tasked with drafting a response to the emails that we got that said this. This has been, this idea has been happening for a while and it is a form of Holocaust inversion and it's very common and we see it with accusation that worse the, you know, Gaza Strip is like the Warsaw Ghetto, that the crime has been committed against the Palestinians say, you know, those crimes are, 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 you know, greatly exaggerated and made to be equivalent to the crimes committed against the Nazis, committed against the Jews, excuse me, by the Nazis, and the Jews are now the new Nazis, as this says, which is incredibly dangerous. So why does this happen? So I'm going to start with the middle one here. So Holocaust inversion is very simple. Jews are no longer seen as victims. The world hates Jews. Jew hatred did not end after the Holocaust. It changed as it always does, but it did not end. So a world that hates Jews has to come to terms with the fact that kind of one of the worst crimes in history was perpetrated against the Jews. So it's a way to completely destroy Jewish victimhood. Also, distance to the Holocaust increases opportunity for people to question it. We're moving away, we're moving, you know, as we know, I'm not sure the age of the people in this call, but probably, you know, we're gonna be some of the last generations to meet Holocaust survivors. So there is distance. People feel able to question it. People feel able to no longer feel guilty. The world doesn't want to feel guilty to the Jews. The world doesn't want to do the work needed to, so, to solve its own Jew hatred. They're not interested in including Jews in the anti-racism movement because they see us as part of the problem. They see us as the perpetrators. And the distance to the Holocaust has allowed people to kind of question it and to cast Jews as, as the perpetrators. And quite simply, ignorance compounds the problem. So there was a claims conference um, report that was published in 2021 that found that nearly one third of all Americans, 31% and more than four in 10 millennials, 41% believe that substantially less than 6 million Jews were killed, 2 million or fewer. There is complete and utter ignorance about the crimes. And this is horrifying. It's horrifying. We see here there were over 40,000 camps and ghettos. 49% of millennials cannot name a single one. An alarming 52% of millennials cannot name even one concentration camp and ghetto again, and nearly one quarter, 22 of millennials haven't heard or not sure if they've heard of the Holocaust. 
Seven out of 10 Americans say fewer people care about the Holocaust than they used to. That is what we're seeing. People care less. And with the rise of other kind of trends, with the obsessive, you know, with kind of the propagation of obsessive anti-Zionism in the new millennium, we're seeing people care less and we're seeing people cast Jews as the perpetrators and we're seeing people universalize it. And it's all incredibly dangerous. But how do we counter it, okay? Because if any of you know me, my work always has to focus on a solution. So we do it by reclaiming our experience, by reclaiming our story. Representing the specificity of the Holocaust does not mean not discussing other victims. So we should discuss the persecution of gay and bisexual men. We should also discuss the persecution of the Roma. But it does mean recognizing each experience as separate and unique, and that the status and circumstances of the Jews during this period was distinct. We have to reclaim our experience. We have to refuse, we have to reject non-Jewish attempts to universalize, to invert our experience. And we have to not take part in it ourselves in a way to get them to care. We have to focus on Holocaust education. And it's really frightening because in some countries, in some American states, Holocaust education is mandated. But look at those statistics. It doesn't necessarily mean quality education is being provided. Holocaust education must include context of Jew hate and it must include context of Jewish life. We are more than just what was done to us. We're more than just the experiences during the Shoah or the pogroms or the Jew hate we experience today. We are an incredible civilization that has survived for 4,000 years and we have not just survived, we have thrived. So last term or last year, I taught a class on the Holocaust and the last day of the class, I took the students to an Israeli restaurant. And they were like, why are we here? And I said, because this is what we have done. We have survived. We built a state. Our story did not end in 1945. We're still writing it today. We are still writing it today. And as I said, the story that led to the murder of 6 million Jews did not begin with the Nazis in 1933. It began thousands of years ago and is still being written today, which is why we have to work incredibly hard to reclaim this, not just for memory and dignity, because we're seeing it used against us. And we're seeing the events that led to the Holocaust in some ways be repeated today. I'm not saying that this is like 1933. I'm saying that we're part of the same story. Ultimately, it goes down to Jewish pride. And I know this sounds kind of an odd thing to talk about in a lecture about Holocaust revisionism, but Jewish pride, one of the central tenets that I created with Jewish pride is the rejection of non-Jewish definitions of the Jewish experience and identity, good or bad. So we're not going to allow them to take our experiences from us. We're not going to allow them to define our identity. We are in charge of our experience and our identity. We get to define it and we must not be afraid to do so. And that sounds easier said than done because the world constantly shames us. When Jews are specific, when we say the Holocaust is a specific experience, the non-Jewish world accuse us of being against universal values, of being against universalism, of universal morality. We have to reject their definition. We have to define our own identities and our own experience. So that is the lecture part of this, uh, this conversation over. And now I'm going to open up for questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and take a drink of water. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Hurrah. Oh, so, so articulate and eloquent, Ben. Um, you. You're a true professor. I seriously, have you ever, I mean, like, are you thinking about academia long term, do you think? Yeah, I had this conversation with my partner the other day because we're moving to London. And when, when we move, I'm going to be like writing and speaking full time for a couple of years. I think I would like to do, to do academia. A, I'm going to be honest, I'm a little scared. You know better than anyone, Blake. You are the student leader. You know how dangerous academia is for Jews. And it's scary. Like, you know, to commit myself to, great, four years as the only Jew in a, fa in a faculty is very scary to me. Um, and I'm just not sure I want to deal with that. And also, to be honest, I find academia a little, um, like, it's kind of elitist. You know, I, I don't know how you feel. I read some academic work, and I have to read the same sentence three or four times. And this is what I do for a living. Yeah. And I'm like, I still don't know what this person has said. Yeah, I mean, of course, that's always going to be out there. But I feel like I don't know what other options exist for people who, you know, truly get the 
like I spoke with the IDF last month and mm. doing a lecture on oh. psychology of anti-Semitism. And it was, I just had such a rush from doing what you just did. And yeah. it, it, it makes us feel like we're really committing an impact. So bravo yeah. again, very well Thank done. You. Um, okay, so we have a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to um, ask them. Um, we have some comments in the chat and then some comments that were DM'd to me on Instagram. That works as well. Um, and then um, some comments that were emailed to us. So um, the first thing is um, from Michael Brook. He says, if you ask any Polish Holocaust survivor how things were in Poland, it will contradict heavily with the official government line. So I guess that kind of uh, harkens back to the part of the lecture where you discussed, you know, Eastern European countries that are, you know, run by right wing leaders, um, it seems, um, you know, and, and we even see it in Western Europe, like, you know, Marine Le Pen, you know, and her family has a history of trying to kind of rewrite France's history and the persecution of its Jews um, because of like a nationalist pride type of thing. And they want their children to be proud of their country. Um, so what do you make of, uh, like, I guess a more specific question would be, it's kind of frustrating to me when I see some Israeli leaders um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, value their friendship with these countries, even though they're doing these, yeah. these, these things to the memory of the Shoah. Um, obviously it's for political strategic reasons, but it still kind of hurts. Yeah. Um, and then what do you make of it uh, for the Jewish population in those countries and how, you know, they're supposed to handle this and then grapple with it? And should they make, you know, should they speak out? Should they not speak out? And, and are they in a position to speak out, et cetera? I think with Israel, I mean, it's it's difficult, right? Because we see this with all democratic countries. They, they do business with totalitarian states or kind of unsavory um, regimes. But I do think that the Israeli leaders who are engaging in these conversations should be bringing these conversations, should be having this specific conversation. Because listen, every society, everyone can grow and change. It's not that, okay, now Poland is this place and it's going to be this way forever. Who knows what can happen with, with education? Um, we have to, of course, start the conversation. So Naftali Bene or whoever has to be really bringing this conversation up and saying, we're not, going to, we're not going to not talk about it. We're not going to be afraid to talk about it just because we want to do business. Although that's a very kind of principled position to take and I'm not in government. I don't think that the local populations are in a position to say anything. This is the problem. It's now illegal. Right. So it's now state-sponsored, legalized Holocaust denial. But I think that we have to say something. And I saw someone said that they, these counts go after Roots Metal all the time. It's The minute you mention Poland on Twitter, it's like it's almost like a <laughs> five, four, three, two, one, and it's like whoosh, and they all come at you. But we're not going to be intimidated. We're not going to deny our truth because they're liars, because they're racists and right. because they're unafraid of, you know, facing up to their facts. And this is a trend we see in many countries. You know, Japan has done it with their experience during the Second World War with the Chinese. They don't talk about it, but it's an attack on truth. It's an attack on our memories and it's an attack on us. And as you know, Michael said, Polish Holocaust survivors, you know, how are they meant to think? And they already have a complicated situation because they, like Zelensky, are the inheritors of this Eastern European Soviet mentality on the Holocaust. So I think we, in, as Jews living in kind of more liberal states with more freedom of expression, should be raising this conversation and not speaking over them, of course, but raising the conversation where they're unable to. Right, right. No, I agree. Thank you for that. Um... Okay, this is from every single time, this is from Phoenix, every single time an anti-Semitic incident happens at a school in Connecticut, the articles and administrators never mention the word Jewish or anti-Semitism, always something about hate of all kinds though. I've been noticing it for a while now. Yeah. Um, I think that was kind of self-explanatory from your talk, but obviously that's problematic. Yeah, massively. And I mean, we saw it, you know, last May, and we're coming up to the anniversary of that unbelievably traumatic month, six week period of that war that, you know, we spoke then to each other and we spoke very publicly about it. Mm -hmm. And we saw major politicians, I think Elizabeth Warren talked about anti Semitism and Islamophobia. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Actually, we're not seeing attacks on Muslims in the street in the way that we're seeing attacks on Jews. And yeah, talk about Islamophobia, but do it in its own Twitter post. It's, it's universalization because Jews, and this goes back to the 19th century, the Jews were seen as being specific. And the non-Jewish world, the enlight enlightened European world, didn't like that. They wanted us to be remade in their image, remade 
as universalist. So Jewish specificity contradicts that. And this is an extension of that. The fact that they cannot even, the fact that there's articles in the Holocaust that don't mention the word Jew is insane. And you're right, um, Phoenix, they always say hate of all kinds. I mean, it's literally all lives mattering. It's this constant, it's constant. We're seeing these constant all lives mattering all the time and we're expected to put up with it and we're not going to put up with it this is what jewish pride is we're not going to allow them to all lives matter us they're going to do it we have to understand and i think that blake you share my perspective on this jew hate is a non-jewish problem the kind of non-jewish world is going to do what it's going to do we of course fight we fight to keep it at bay to feed you keep jew hatred at bay and we fight for our dignity because we know that we deserve better. But ultimately, if Elizabeth Warren wants to put out a tweet that you know makes a false equivalence between Jew hatred and Islamophobia, then she's going to do that. But we will be there calling her out for it because we're not going to allow them to do this, to kind of just, because if they succeed, then think about the catastrophe that will be Holocaust memory. There'll be generations of people growing up not understanding that it was a specifically Jewish experience and the Jews had a specific experience. That is, and I know other people have said this, but this is, I think Elie Wiesel said it, it's killing people twice. We have to honor their memory. We have to understand the events that led to it. Right, right, definitely. Um, all still very well said. Okay, um, so this is from Sadie, um, who's on the board of uh, NZC. Um, she says, do you think there is a particular way in which you think we should inspire Jewish pride or simply allow it to grow on its own as we incorporate ourselves in it to the Zionist narrative? So I absolutely think we have to be specific and we have to be purposeful. We cannot allow it to just grow on its own because if we do, who knows what will happen, right? We have to be very clear on the aims of Jewish pride. We have to be very clear on the aims of what we're trying to achieve, of why this generation of Jews is slightly different to the ones that came kind of more recently before us. And I think the way we talk about Jewish pride is by talking about it. You know, we simply get on Twitter, we get in conversations with our friends, we wear our Magen David, our kippot. I've got mine here, you can't see because my hair is so big, but I've got my tartan kippah clipped in. And I'm not religious. I'm not actually a religious Jew. My partner isn't Jewish. I don't keep kosher. I wear this because I'm a proud Jew and I want to go into the world as a Jew. And to be quite honest, I want to mark myself as a Jew. I know that the non-Jewish world has marked us as Jewish as a way to demonize us, humiliate us. But when Blake wears his Magen David, when I wear my kippah, we're choosing to mark ourselves with pride. And that is incredibly important. So I think that we have to do this very purposely. And I know that, you know, Jewish pride is, it's for me as well as for everyone else, right? When I put on my kippah, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel like a proud Jew, but we have to stand up and be role models. When I was a kid, I'm a little, and I would say a little bit, I'm significantly older than probably most of the people on this call. I'm significantly older than Blake. But when I was a kid, there was no role models. We, as British Jews especially, we love seeing American Jews featured on TV because they were never featured on British TV, but they're actually featured in kind of a humiliating way. They were never really featured in a way which was really positive or meaningful. So we kind of accepted scraps and we're going to reject the scraps. We're going to work to reject the shame of Jew hatred. Now, this is very important. We talk a lot. I mean, yesterday was Yom HaShoah, yesterday my time. Yesterday was Yom show. We talk a lot about our dead and we're, we're, we're quite good as a people about remembering those who were stolen from us, but we're not as good at remembering or understanding the psychological impact of all this on Jews. So we have to reject the shame and say, no, you might try to shame us. We will not become ashamed. And then number two, we're going to reject non-Jewish definitions of Jewish identity. As gay men, we would not stand for the heterosexual world telling us what it meant to be gay meant to be what it meant to be LGBTQ. We're not going to stand for that because they don't get to tell us, just as the non-Jewish world does not get to tell us what it means to be a Jew. And we're going to be polite, we're going to educate, we're going to empower, that's really important, but we're not going to stand for it. We're going to be proud and we're going to put boundaries in place of things we will and will not talk about and things that we will um, kind of advocate for. So I hope that answered your question, Sadie, but yeah, it has to be purposeful and it has to be loud. Yes. Really definitely. loud. Really loud. Okay, that was all wonderful. 
Thank you so much. Um, this is a, we're, we're out of time, but this is just the last question that maybe you can answer um, very quickly. Um, it's from Sarah, based on our academia discussion, maybe. She says, would you consider facilitating a virtual series on building slash connecting to Jewish pride, like an expansion or workshop of your book? Absolutely, yes. And maybe that is something that New Zionist Congress and I can discuss in the future. Um, you unmuted yourself. I saw you were about to say something. I was about to, I said, oh my God, a cliffhanger. Yes, exactly. Dot, dot, dot. Yeah, listen, a hundred percent. I mean, this is this is my. Somebody asked me the other day why I do this work, and I said like it's kind of my destiny. I worked in fashion for a period. I used to intern at Tom Ford, and I love fashion. Yeah, I people a lot of people don't know that. Come on, but, Tom Ford. I know Tommy F. He's very uh, very charming, but the, I I was drawn back to this world because it's my destiny and I want to do everything I can do to I like people like Blake. I mean, I'm not alone, of course, like New Zionist Congress, we have to do everything we can do to inspire this generation. And we have to be clear about our, our aims. And, you know, again, so one of the reasons, let me just tell you a very, very short story. I had very ill mental health as a teenager, very, very ill mental health because I really couldn't accept my sexual orientation. And there was one point I reached rock bottom. And at this rock bottom, I realized something really, which is kind of obvious, but also seen as quite radical, that I had done nothing wrong. I was being punished for a crime I hadn't committed. I was this young gay boy being told by the world that I was broken, that there was something wrong with me. And I felt that I internalized it. And that realization that I had done nothing wrong led me towards LGBTQ plus pride. And I think that we have to understand it in the same way in the same way with regards to Jew hatred, we've done nothing wrong. And it's that's why my work really focuses as much on fighting Jew hatred as it does on kind of spreading, building Jewish pride, because we have to work on ourselves. We have to heal ourselves. We have to have difficult conversations with our community, ourselves, that kind of are not necessarily connected to the non-Jewish world. So absolutely, I would consider doing that. I would love to have a partner, dot, dot, dot. Dot, um, dot, dot. So yes, 100%. There's the cliffhanger. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, again, such, we're so appreciative to have you, Ben. That was wonderful. Thank you so much again for coming. Thank you um, to the participants, our, our attendees. Um, as always, if you'd like to see, if you liked this event and would like to see more of these events uh, in the future, um, we're trying to shift, NZC is trying to shift toward in-person programming over the summer and especially in the fall. Um, you can definitely sign up to become a member of our organization at newzionists.org. That's newzionists, plural, dot org. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter at New Zionists and on Instagram at New Zionist Congress. Um, and we have a donation drive going on right now. Um, from now until Yom Hatzma'ud, all donations will be doubled. Um, so you can donate to us uh, also on our website, newzionists.org. Thank you, Ben, again. I'm going to plug Ben Freeman's website one more time. Um, is it .org or .com, Ben? .com. Oh, God, .com. I don't know. I think it's .com. I know, right? I do that all the time. I can't forget. I, with like, like websites that I run, I do that. Um, okay, so benfreeman.com. You can look at his book. You can order his book. I would definitely recommend it. Um, and follow Ben on Twitter. Is it just... What is it, Ben? At, at Ben M. Freeman. You've got to remember the M, at Ben M. Freeman. Twitter and Instagram. Twitter and Instagram. Okay, so do that. And um, thanks, everyone, so much for coming. Lila Tov and or Ben Boker Tov. Boker Tov. Yes. <laughs> Hong Kong. Uh, all right. Bye, everyone. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you.